very much, Derek, for the introduction, and thanks to EHDB for inviting me to speak this evening, and especially to you all for taking the time um, to log in and listen to the talk. So I hope it's interesting and of some use to you. You can always let me know if it's not. Um, and indeed, I do hope you can understand the very Scottish accent. I will try and speak slowly. So I'm going to be very practical tonight. Um, my big interest is on farm control. Um, so I'm hoping just to run through uh, the latest from the Morden and from other researchers, um, how we apply that on farm, and indeed a lot of our experiences with farmers who have had or continue to have a major cryptosporidium problems. Right, my sorry, my presentation seems to have stuck. There we go. So first of all, a little bit about the background. Um, Cryptosporidium is a parasite, and that's one of the first really important um, issues to get a hold of as regarding um, treatment and how to control it. So um, basically, because it's a parasite, um, antimicrobials will not touch it at all. Um, there are over 30 species of this um, parasite. Fortunately, not all of those cause disease. Of the four found in cattle, there really only is one that's been proven to cause any type of disease, and that is Cryptosporidium parvum. So for this evening, I will just call that C. parvum, so you know what I'm talking about. So in calves, as I'm sure we'll all know, uh, the first clinical sign you're likely to see is a scouring calf. Um, this can very quickly lead to dehydration because it generally is a disease of young calves. Um, and this is because the calf is born with very little immune defense against the parasite. Um, they do gain that as they get older, which is why we very rarely see disease in older calves. The calf, of course, will lose appetite. Um, they, we think they probably have quite a lot of pain. We know from humans that have a cryptosporidium, um, it's a very painful condition. Uh, the calf will very quickly lose weight, go downhill. There will be a raised temperature in all likelihood. And it's quite often followed by death if um, the calf isn't cared for. Um, the other side of Cryptosporidium parvum is that it is a zoonotic um, parasite, which means that we can, it can pass from animals to humans and cause disease there as well. It is a very, can be a very serious disease in young children or the very elderly or MD who's immune compromised for any reason. Um, so it is very important that if you know you have Cryptosporidium on farm that you keep um, all these sorts of people um, away. So the species found in cattle, first of all, well, this is a changing picture. So traditionally, um, from birth to about two months old, we would mainly see C. C. parvum in calves. And this is what we continue to see in this country, in the UK. Um, in other countries, there are reports of other species, but we'll just concentrate on the C. parvum as the disease-causing um, organism. Um, in older calves, we tend to see more C. bovis and C. rhinii, and we don't have any evidence that those cause any clinical signs or disease to the calves. Whether there's any production effects of the calves carrying this parasite is something we don't know, but we would be very interested to work on. We have also recently been isolating more C. parvum from this group of calves, but again with no clinical signs. So really as the calves are gaining an immune response to C. parvum, it means they're carrying the parasite, but in actual fact it's not causing disease. In adult cattle, traditionally it's been C. andersoni. There's some studies in New Zealand to suggest that you can have a reduced milk yield in adult cattle that carry this um, species. Um, nothing much has been done in this country on it. But we recently at Morden have been altering our methods of detection, and we are actually finding C. parvum in large numbers of adult cattle. Actually, it can be up to sort of 80% of the herd can be caused them um, carrying C. parvum, which, of course, is, makes it um, interesting for you know, transmission to calves. So, is it a problem? Well, yes, I think we probably all know that it is. Um, and I'm sorry, this is slightly out of date now, but the figures, um, the VIDA figures for 2013 and 14 are very similar to this. Basically showing you there that in the UK, cryptosporidium was the main cause of neonatal enteritis. 
in calves really years or so with other pathogens such as rotavirus or coronavirus, um, E. coli or coccidia. Um, and these are over the whole of the UK, those figures. So it continues to be um, a bit of a problem. We also ran a, quite a big study, and we called it the Crypto Beef Study, along with the Glasgow Vet School just a few years back, um, and focused on two areas in Scotland, the North East and Case Nace, both of which are big beef producing areas. Um, and what we found there was actually quite shocking. And in some of the farms, the problems with crypto was so bad that they were losing sort of about 10% of their calves um, due to enteritis with cryptosporidium um, associated. And actually in one farm, he lost 30% in one year. So we don't underestimate the scale of this problem, which is why we are interested in continuing to research it. And of course, this is a very expensive exercise um, for farmers involved. Um, and those figures there I've given you from the SEC are actually a few years old now, so you can probably add a little bit on to that. So what is the problem and why can't we get rid of this parasite? Well, it is a real pain. It's, it's a very environmentally stable um, egg. So the oocyst is the egg form, and that's the form that hangs around in the environment. Um, and the thing about, about crypto is that as soon as it, it it is excreted from a calf or another animal. Um, it is viable. It's ready to go. Um, so it's got a big sort of hard shell on it. And I think hopefully you can see that from that little um, picture there of a fluorescing oocyst. It's a very, very tough um, shell. This makes it resistant to heat up to about 60 degrees, which is actually quite hot. Um, and cold, it can come out of minus 20 and survive. What it doesn't like is a lot of freeze thawing. And it doesn't like being dried out, desiccated, um, or in intense dry heat. But of course, in our climate, um, it's very able to survive, and it can easily do so. We've taken oocysts out of a fridge at Morden, which are four years old. They've been in water at four degrees, and we've infected calves. So they, they are pretty tough. The other thing is really to do with the biology. Um, of the parasite, um, you'll probably notice if you get crypto for the first time on a farm, the infection spreads through, can spread through groups of calves really rapidly, astonishingly rapidly, really. Um, and as few as 10 oocysts can cause disease. Some people have actually actually do say it's one oocyst. So we need very few. And the other problem is that once an animal is infected, it can shed billions of oocysts. So obviously the infection can ramp up quite quickly. Now, I'm not going to give you a whole big boring life cycle, but really to understand what's happening, I sort of drew out this little diagram just to show you really how a few uses can very quickly turn into billions in a calf's gut. So basically, we have the oocyst here being eaten by a susceptible animal, probably a calf younger than that. Um, into the gut it goes. And because it's ready to hatch immediately, it doesn't have to go through any period of incubation, those four little sporozoites will jump out um, and they burrow into the gut um, where they start to mature into oocysts. And this can happen very rapidly. Um, some of those oocysts are excreted, but we also have a sort of auto-infection cycle. So you get little thin-walled oocysts that just stay in the gut and they cycle round and round. So that really ramps up the infection, which is why the calves can actually go downhill really quickly because the gut is just being attacked um, you know, from all ends. The other important thing to dealing with crypto and farm is to really understand where it's all coming from. And to be honest, we are still learning um, in this score. And we're always surprised at where we can find crypto, especially C. parvum. Some species of crypto are really host specific. So we have ones for turtles and um, snakes and birds, which are pretty specific to these animals. Sea parvum can cause disease in, in quite a lot of animals, including wildlife, um, deer, rabbits, um, other livestock, so lambs um, mainly, um, as well as ourselves. So we've got lots of root, potential routes into the calf. I've highlighted the main routes here in red, so we still think that other calves really are the main threat to young calves. Also, the environment they live in, because the oocyst can survive for such a long time, it hangs around in calf sheds, um, in pasture, quite easily, quite surviving, quite happily from calving to calving if it's not dealt with effectively. 
um, and actually out in pasture as well. They can survive over winter um, in most of our winters that we have quite easily. Um, dams, we're still talking about this. We are quite sure there is some transmission from dam to calve. How much we are working on at the moment, I'll come back to this later. Um, drinking water is an issue. Um, it is a big issue for the water provision companies, as you probably all know, after the Lancash Lancashire outbreak this summer. Um, this is being repeated all over the country um, on numerous occasions in any one year. And it is a problem for the water companies because this parasite is resistant to chlorine, so that doesn't kill it. Um, calves can also be infected from water, and we've just recently had a farm where the source of infection for the young calves is actually the water being pumped into the byre. So that's one to look out for. Um, we are working at the moment quite a lot on wildlife. I've been working on um, red deer and rabbits um, particularly. Um, and we see them as, as quite um, serious reservoirs for the parasite, particularly if they're cross-grazing with livestock. Um, of course, animal handlers, um, you can carry in with this quite easily on boots and coats and hands if you're not careful. So these are all the sort of areas where we can look at trying to block the transmission um, and control the disease. I just wanted to give you some results of some farms that I've been working with up in the northeast of Scotland who have had huge problems with crypto. Um, and despite trying to use all sorts of management tools and techniques that we'll talk about in a minute, they were still having massive problems. And indeed, the water supplies were getting contaminated as well, um, which was leading to further problems in human health. And we were really surprised when we tested red deer. Now, these red deer are out in the hills, and they're sort of running from farm to farm. They're jumping into silage fields where the cattle are grazing the aftermath and out again. And we found 70% of the deer were infected and 80% of the adult cattle, which was really surprising. We had never seen this sort of percentage from adult cattle. Sheep are generally lower carriers of, of crypto. The lambs carried fairly high um, prevalence, but they weren't, they weren't sick. There was no clinical signs. These, these are outdoor lambs. Um, and the calves, actually, the overall percentage was lower than we thought. But it was quite interesting. This 63% this was taken from two different sampling times. And this shows quite neatly how crypto can build up in a calving shade. And this is four different farms, and the results are combined. So in March, it was the very beginning of the spring calving. And we had very low, low rates sorry, of crypto. About 30% of the calves were infected that we tested. But by May, there was maybe 95% so were positive and quite a lot of clinical um, cryptosporidiosis. And this just shows you really how the oocyst quite quickly can build up in the calving shades and pains, leading um, to problems towards the back end of the calving. And I'll come back to this again later on as well. So what do you do if you suspect a crypto outbreak? Well, as with any disease, really, it's diagnosis that's key. And I think probably every vet practice in the country now uses those ready-to-use rapid detection kits, um, which are um, really useful. They're quick, cheap, easy. Um, if used in conjunction with things like clinical signs, farm history, um, and taking a fecal sample, um, the cryptoousis are quite easy to see under the microscope. Um, and normally, um, vet practice would use this sort of stain is Eel Nielsen, which shows up the oocysts really bright pink, so they're, they're quite obvious. Um, so at Morden, we use microscopy. We use um, the Eel Nielsen staining, and we also use the fluorescent staining. So that's this one up here. We are more and more using um, molecular detection by PCR, um, and that is basically a DNA-based test. And that is because this is so much more sensitive. We can detect much lower rates of infection. And we can also detect which species of crypto we have. Because if we, we may see a cryptoousis um, like this one here, but it might be C. bovis or C. rhini, in which case it, it's probably not the parasite or the pathogen that's causing disease. So that's quite an important step forward. Um, if you submit your calf um, to the, the VLA, the veterinary um, laboratories, they will do um, pathological examination of the gut. And it's quite interesting. So I've got two photographs down here, sort of micrographs, 
This is a healthy calf gut, and this is what you'd expect. This is the little villi, this little things here, which um, are lining the intestine, which are their function is in absorption. And you can see in the calf here with the crypto infection, these are, are really pretty destroyed. So not, there's not very much being absorbed here. Another interesting question is how quickly does that gut um, get back to, to its normal state? Or does it ever? Um, and that, those are still questions that, that we're working on. And we're actually doing some work on that um, at the moment. You know, does this disease have production effects for the rest of the calf's life? And those are questions that we're hoping to answer in the next couple of years. So it's diagnosed and you have it. Um, it's very difficult to get rid of. So what are the options? Well, we have very limited options. So we have no vaccines to prevent disease. Um, that's not to say there never will be. There's a lot of work going on. Um, and at Morton, we're, we're working on this as well. At the moment, your product um, of choice would be Halicure. Now, this um, has pros and cons. The pros are definitely that it reduces scouring and shedding, and your calves get better quickly. Um, one con really is that you shouldn't really give it to calves that are scouring already. So that makes it more of a preventative than a treatment in that if you catch the calf before it starts scouring, if you've got crypto on farm, it really will reduce the level of infection in that calf. It has to be used for seven consecutive days from birth. You need to get, into, get it into the calf quickly on a full stomach. Um, so that's, that's pretty time consuming. And I know for beef farmers, um, it's not the easiest thing to be doing at all. Um, but at the moment, um, that's how we tend to firefight. So fortunately, there are really good management options that do make a difference. And we work with a lot of farms that have major problems. So we're open to vet practices coming to us and seeing there is a massive problem. And we can hopefully um, help by looking at the whole sort of farm management setup. So the first thing really is to reduce environmental contamination. Um, and we would always advocate steam cleaning of animal pens and calving areas. So there's a double effect here. You're washing away use this, and if you're steam cleaning hot enough, the heat will also kill them. So that's a double whammy. It will only work really well if the shed has been properly mucked out. So it's got to be a pretty clean shed before you start that, but that can definitely make a difference. Once the shed's been steam cleaned, it, it is really important to let the shed dry if you possibly can, because again, desiccation will kill the oocyst quite quickly. Um, and then what we would do then is use, make sure we're using an effective disinfectant. And that's more difficult than you might think. So I'll come back to this and give you a list of what we know are effective um, and what we're working on. Cleaning calving areas frequently. Now, that's really important. If you remember back to the graph that I showed of the buildup of the oocyst, the more often you can clean the calving areas, uh, the less oocysts you'll have in them. Even if you can't clean, if you can deep bed them and regularly to keep them away from any feces, that, then that really, again, will, will help um, reduce the c contamination level in the calves. And something just to remember for if you use slurry or manure um, on the field is crypto can survive up to 60 degrees, so you really want it well fermented or you're just going to be spraying it all over your fields in, in the active form. Animal management is really important. And I suppose really a lot of these is just to do with good animal management and isn't only firefighting cryptosporidium, but can also apply for, for lots of other disease. So the main one is, and I've bolded it up because it is really the main one, is, is colostrum. And this is the most important thing you can do for the calf in total. Um, and certainly where crypto is concerned, it's really vital. And I'll come back to the three cues in a little while as well. Oh, sorry, I didn't do that. Um, using Halicare as a preventative, so if you've got a history of cryptosporidium um, infection, Halicare can be used as calves hit the ground after their first feed. Um, you can start using Halicare, which can help a situation. 
Obviously, it's really important to keep your sick calves rehydrated with electrolytes and also to keep them really warm. And I think AHDB have actually just produced a very useful and informative guide on calf jackets um, for sick calves. And certainly, some of the dairies we've worked with recently have resorted to this, um, and it's made a huge difference. Now, the keeping animals in age groups, I know, is more popular with dairies, again, than beef. But it's again, it can really make a huge difference. Um, because as we've seen before, the older calves could still shed C. parvum, even though they're not clinically infected. So keeping them in age groups is keeping those young calves away from older animals, particularly in their first few months of life. Um, good management also would be you know, to feed and treat your healthy animals first. Um, controlling other pathogens which cause scouring calves, um, I'll come back to as well, because that's an important one. And also, if quarantining is a good idea, if you can do it, and I, I fully realize it's not practical in all situations at all, but if you can do it, and you're going to do that, then it's good to be aware that the, the animals will actually, the calves will actually keep shedding cryptoousis once they've stopped scouring. So I've just done this little graph, and this is just a sort of general graph to show you the idea. So we've done quite a bit of work in this at Morden, and we've shown really that Although the animals may stop scouring um, at this point here, it can take them up to a week for them to drop down the excretion levels um, down to sort of base levels again. So it's really important if these calves at that point, so between stopping scouring and the next week, are kept away from any neonatal calves. So I'll go back to colostrum first, um, because obviously this is prime importance. So as I've said already, at birth, the calf really doesn't have very much to fight off these things with. And it's really relying on its maternal antibodies. So this is why it's important that a, well, preferably they would get their colostrum from their mother. Or if you're pooling colostrum, um, say on a dairy farm, that it's your own, own farm colostrum. Because then you will know if you've got a crypto problem, the dams will definitely have antibodies. So the calves will getting those. Now, Intervet did a really interesting study a wee little while back, um, and they estimated that up to about 50% of the calves in the UK don't get enough colostrum for maximum protection. So we're talking here about giving the calf, you know, the very best. So the CQs, I'm sure you all know, so I'll just whiz through those, although I just wanted to bring up this point about quickness. So current advice at the moment is as soon after birth as possible and within six hours. But there's a very interesting graph being produced by Intervate, who did a quite a big study on calves. Now, if you see this graph here, so this is, ooh, wait a minute, right, there we go. Um, when the calf is born, it has about 35% of the antibodies are absorbed through the gut. And this is because the gut is what we call leaky, it's quite open to absorbing big molecules, which antibodies are. So at birth, you can do that pretty well. But if you notice along the bottom axis, at six hours, you know it's lost a lot of its capacity already. So one of the deities we've been recently been working with who've had a crypto problem have actually put somebody on calves pretty much full time to catch everything within the first hour. So they're catching them now here. And this has made a massive difference to the amount of clinical crypto they have. They still have the parasite, but the calves are just so much um, more able to, to withstand the clinical disease. And you can see it, it falls off pretty quickly. So you know, by 24 hours, that leaky gut is, is totally um, joined up, and there'll be no antibodies um, going through at that point. Quality is another um, interesting one. Um, and as this varies with breeds, so your dairy breeds will have a lower quality because of the quantity they produce. Um, heifers tend to have less than older cows. And this can be measured using colostrometers, and it's probably quite a good idea to do that because, again, you can look at your nutrition of the dam, and there are ways to promote, obviously, a higher quality colostrum on the run up to calving. Now, quantity is something that everybody bandies about different figures for. And I've 
just had a big search of all the websites and pretty much this is what they're seeing. So three to four litres, which is your calf suckling off the dam for roughly 20 minutes, which is quite a long time for a newborn. And that will give you maximum immunity. And if you do this within one hour of birth and another two to three litres before six hours is up, that gives you the maximum. Now, I know you'll all be going, that is absolutely not practical, and you're probably right. Um, but if you can get as close to that ideal as possible, um, then that, that's going to help. Infectants. Now, this is also a subject um, that causes concern. And the disinfectants I'm showing you here are really nasty. So I've gotten read there, you know, please follow the safety and use the instructions really carefully. A lot of the farm normal disinfectants, so farm, bircon, um, sorgene, at the recommended concentrations will not kill cryptosporidium. Now, some of these ones are quite difficult to get hold of, but we know, well, certainly in Scotland, I'm sorry, I don't know the situation in the rest of the UK, but maybe you can let me know. We can get kenocox up here quite readily now, and we can get hydrogen peroxide. So these are both very effective disinfectants for crypto. Again, not effective if the shed is full of muck. It has to be fairly clean um, before you apply it. Um, I don't apply it anywhere near animals, and please don't breathe it in yourself. It's, it's pretty nasty. Um, we've got a new one, um, a killcox, which has been, we've had reports saying it's effective against cryptosporidium. It's actually made for coccidia, uh, and crypto and coccidia are, are different. There's differences in the biology of the parasite. Um, we have a PhD student working at the moment who's going to be looking at this whole area. Um, and trialling all of these disinfectants. So hopefully we'll have some more concrete results pretty soon. So what else can we do? Well, we can control some of the other pathogens that cause scour in calves. Uh, one of the most effective vaccinate dams prior to calving, so between 12 and 3 weeks of calving, with Rotavec Corona vaccine. Now that won't do a thing for crypto at all, but it will help control rotavirus, coronavirus, and E. coli. But again, it does depend on adequate colostrum uptake um, in the calves. So we're back to the colostrum management side of things. But if this is all, all done correctly, then this is a quite an effective way of reducing other disease in the calves. Feeding adult cattle with decox has been reported to help reduce in, in diarrhea um, caused by amelia, which is what causes coccidiosis. Um, so all those things will just give the calves a fighting chance. Cryptosporidium is really what we call opportunistic. It's there in the environment pretty much all the time. It's when the calf goes down with something else that it really tends to attack. Um, so if you can control those other things, you know that can really help. And obviously, along with that, as we've said before, accurate diagnosis is really key. Um, so you know what you're dealing with, and you can treat it accordingly. And there are good screening programs out with um, the methods of, of diagnosis. Um, and that's just an example of a CAV enteritis package from, from ACC. So you'll be glad I'm running out of steam now. Um, a summary of on-farm control. I think it's really useful to think about this pre-calving. Um, we're working with a lot of farms, as I've said, and a lot of vets. Um, interactive herd health plans are really helpful for this. It's things, you know, when you, you do your rotavec corona vaccine, and, um, and thinking ahead and planning before the calving hits you. So, um, as I said already, controlling the pathogens that you can control. Um, getting the dam's nutrition light right to maximise your colostrum quality, the cleaning of the shed, the correct disinfectants, allowing the shed to dry out. So these are all the things that can be done pre-calving to help give you a fighting chance before you get too busy. Um, for calving and during colostrum management, absolutely key. If you can, age group calves. We've had a lot of success with this. Um, and I think the most successful is probably if they're within two weeks of each other. Again, it's a, it's a fair bit of work, but um, 
it's something I think if, if a farm is really bad with cryptosporidiosis, it's well worth thinking about. Now, keeping sheds clean as calving progresses. So there's been quite a lot of studies done on this. So of course, as you would imagine, really, the best results you can get are from doing all three, mucking out, then disinfecting, and then using plenty clean straw. But that's not always practical either. Um, if you can only use clean straw, that's going to be better than none of it. Um, but just be aware, if you can move the calves and do all of those, then that really does help the tail enders um, and keeps the levels of infection down. You know, and think about Halicure as a preventative um, if you're having a problem um, year on year with crypto. I mean, most farms get some good years and some bad years, and we're not really sure why that is. And a lot of farmers will say to us, well, I did exactly the same thing. Um, so, you know, is that difference in cost from that year from the next? Um, it's, it's difficult to see. So we are working on this at Morden. and we do take this problem really seriously. I think with the numbers tonight that I have logged in um, to listen, it just shows you what a, what a problem it is. We've been improving how we diagnose uh, and detect, so we can detect down to low levels and, as I've said before, identify the species. We also do source tracking, so we're looking at different types of sea parvum, where it's all coming from and who's passing it to who, and that's really important when it comes to infection via wildlife. We're also busy at the moment with a big immunological study. It's involving a lot of animals, and this is really to work out what the parasite is doing to the host gut and how the host responds. Uh, this is very important because what we want to move this on to is vaccine studies. So basically, that gives us a handle on the host's own response, and that's what we want to mimic in the calf um, using vaccines if we can. So we are that is our main aim. That's what we're really keen um, to get. But of course, as you know, these things take a ridiculously long time. So on-farm transmission and control, we're still working on that. In fact, we have a PhD student just started, um, and she is sponsored by AHDB. She's going to be looking at dam to calf transmission um, and all the forms of control we've talked about, like the work with the disinfectants. She's also going to be doing some production studies, um, and I think that will be really, really illuminating, as in if these calves have clinical crypto at, at birth, does that carry on to either poorer carcass at slaughter or longer time to slaughter or lower body weight um, or lower live weight gain? So, these are all questions that we, we hope we'll be able to answer fairly soon. So, right, we've heard to the end. If you've just got a week and come back from your cup of tea, the really important things are the cryptobusters up there on the screen, particularly colostrum, but also disinfectant uh, bedding and age groups. So, I uh, thank you all very much for listening, and I do hope that has been useful in some degree.